Dementia has a variety of causes and treatments. What's happening to my memory? Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. It's normal for us to walk into another room then wonder why we're going there. But how do we know when those memory lapses cross the lines and signal possible dementia? Tonight we'll answer your questions about signs of causes and treatments for dementia. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. For those over the age 85, about what percentage have some level of dementia? 75%, 50%, 25%? We'll have the answer later in the show. Joining us tonight is Dr. Jerry Freeman of Sanford Neurology Clinic, Sioux Falls, and the head of neurosciences and neurology at the School of Medicine for South Dakota, Sanford School of Medicine, USD. Thank you for joining us, Jerry. Glad to be here. So you're, you do a lot of teaching as uh, the head of neurology, and it sort of includes ethics. It, it does. Um, the department, the neurosciences department, my department, has a section that deals principally with values and ethics. And so we start teaching, talking about that with the beginning students, and then carry it through the four years. You know, as you were talking to our pre-med and pre-professional students tonight, you emphasize that there is a central core to ethics. Would you explain that uh, point that you were making? Well, when, when I think about values and ethics in the medical profession, I think how important it is for the physicians to feel a very real responsibility unwavering responsibility for the welfare of the patient. And I, I use the term covenant. Uh, That's a promise. A promise. A promise that what we do will be focused on what's best for the patient, irregardless of, of their financial situation or their politics or their uh, you know, other beliefs or occupations. It's for the welfare of the patient. And I think if, if people in medicine have that view, it serves them very well in terms of making good judgments and value decisions. That, that promise. Uh, you know, and I think about it, if uh, the physician is here, the patient comes in disadvantaged because they need the help of the, uh, the physician. And, and uh, to take advantage of a person in that spot is the wrong thing to do. It's the very wrong thing to do. And some, in modern day, some people have said, well, medicine should be like a business. Uh, but it's not like buying a car or real estate or making an investment. People who are ill or worried they are ill, are they're worried they're ill, are vulnerable and dependent. And they, they look to people in healthcare to be on their side, to try to do what's best and safest. So in ethics, there are a, a long slew of words, you know, uh, beneficence and non-maleficence and, and veracity and autonomy and so on and so forth. And you said to the students that there's a, a, a simple way to really think about it. Well, I, I think it's important to, to recognize that what we do and how we do it is important. They're both important. We can do wonderful technical work, but if we aren't <clears throat> cognizant of the patient's interests and welfare, it, it falls short. And the term I like best, because it's simple and memorable, is kindness. Kindness in medicine and in the rest of life has everything to do with what we're trying to accomplish and how we do it, how we act. So I stress kindness early on to the students. Well, my sense is that you're a very kind man, and, and we all know that, Jerry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're talking uh, issues of memory, though, tonight. Mm -hmm. So let's veer a little bit off of the issues of ethics, and let's talk about memory and uh, when memory is significantly impaired, which is called dementia. What about uh, that question of... of um, getting up and, and going into the kitchen and not remembering what you did. I mean, you heard that old joke that as we get older, we are always thinking more about the hereafter. You get up to the 
kitchen and you go, what am I here after? So, well, bad I, joke, but I mean, but what about I that? Where, where you're beginning, though, is, is something that confronts many people, especially when people age, get 40, 50, 60, everybody's memory de declines some, and you don't remember names quite as well, and oftentimes I have people come to see me who really don't have any major memory impairment, but they're noticing they're a little more forgetful, and frequently these people are also hard driving, they're multitasking, they have a lot of distractions, okay. and it's not surprising in that context that maybe they don't remember as well. Right. And so I love it when a patient comes to me about his or her memory, and I can reassure them that their memory is fine. Yeah. Their lifestyle, perhaps, is is a little too is, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, but it's their memory is fine. Not, it's not always the case, but when they come in and they're worried about their memory, generally, that's a good sign that their memory is just fine. It frequently is. I, I've been struck over the years that. There, in people who really have memory impairment, like Alzheimer's disease, many of those individuals know their memory is failing and worry about it, but it's not uncommon for people to simply be unaware. And that can be frustrating for, for family members and, and caregivers, but some people just continue to deny, are not aware that they have memory impairment. Or cover it up. Or cover it up, yeah. But if, if somebody's trying to cover it up, they're probably in the first category, oh, where they're oh. grieving their memory loss yeah. and embarrassed about it. Yeah, that's it. Right. Well, what do we do to test for uh, a person? I know we're going to have a, a, a segment later about testing, but how do you sense uh, signs of a person with early uh, memory issues? Well, as in most of medicine, and certainly in your field, internal medicine, the history is critically important. And if possible, I like to get the history from not only the patient, but from significant others. Um, has there been memory decline? How has it manifested itself? Um, have, there, have there been problems at work, problems driving, that kind of thing? And then, uh, we always do a thorough neurologic examination to make sure there isn't something amiss like subtle weakness on one side. If somebody had weakness on one side, you might worry about a blood clot on the surface of the brain or a tumor. And then there are specific memory tests that can be done. And there are a number of tests that are done right in the office and are simple, maybe 30 questions, but they can give a pretty good idea if somebody really has memory impairment. I, um, I often think that the, the, the cardinal sign is the antegrade memory loss, that you can't learn a new thing. You may have great memory of when you were in the childhood or early years of your life, but if you can't, get to, can't keep a new thought. And so, actually, my first test is, you know, three questions. What are, you know, can Apple, Arizona, and, and uh, you know, Chevrolet, can you repeat those after me? and then yeah. later on. Uh, I, 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 agree, I, I agree with you. I mean, this is part of the short questionnaire I was talking about. Frequently, people can have significant cognitive issues and still remember details from when they were a child or young person. Yeah. The, the more recent memory pre frequently fades first. Right, that, that antegrade, learn yeah. a new thing. Yeah. Yeah, I did uh, one su survey looking at uh, in, the, in the nursing home, how many people were demented uh, or had some uh, dementia signs and did uh, thorough testing and then asked the head nurse, is that person demented or not? And the answer that the head nurse did gave was all, perfectly correlated <laughs> with, this, with the careful testing. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of that, ha the, the, the te testing has to do uh, with that antegrade memory and function. And the function story comes from the wife or the husband who, who brings them in and says, something's amiss. That's right. And that's why I started out by saying you, uh, a clinician wants to listen very closely to the history that's provided by the patient and the family or other caregivers, because you can get really important clues. Now, there, there are different kinds of, of dementia, uh, uh, different causes for dementia. There, there, there are. and. Um, uh, 
if you look at dementia as a whole, the most common is Alzheimer's. I mean, as people age, they're at increased risk for Alzheimer's, and that's the single most uh, frequent. But you can get uh, memory impairment from a variety of other things. Uh, vitamin deficiency, severe vitamin B12 deficiency can cause it. Alcoholism uh, is a potential cause. Repeated head trauma can cause it. So there are a number of other possibilities uh, to consider. A lot of causes to think about. Yeah. And they may present differently. They may indeed, yeah. The diagnosis of dementia is made by a medical team. It's a team. The role of the speech language pathologist, or the SLP, is to assess cognitive communication deficits related to dementia. Most oftentimes when I get a referral for cognition, um, it's either due to a brain injury, so a stroke, or maybe someone has fallen, um, gotten a car accident, something like that. We also will get referrals for patients that are maybe living independently or um, semi-independently, and their family may be concerned about their ability to live that way safely. So they will call us to go in and do a number of different things to kind of check and see how, how well they can make decisions and complete tasks on their own. Typically, testing for dementia is pretty standard across the board. Um, we use a couple of different tests, one of them being the mini mental state examination, a cognitive screener. It looks at a number of different areas. The first thing it looks at is orientation. So it will test the patient's knowledge of where they are, um, the year, the date, the day of the week. From there, it moves into more uh, memory assessments. So it will look at immediate memory. I will ask the patient, I want you to remember three words for me. And those words are apple, book, and coat. And then I will ask the patient, what were the words? So it, it tests their immediate recall of what I just told them. I will ask them to do one of two things. Either they start from the number 100 and count backwards by sevens, or I will ask them to spell world backwards. Once they have completed that, then I will ask, okay, what were those three words that I wanted you to remember? So that will test more of their ability to recall from longer ago after a distracting task. So after we test that, we'll go into some more immediate recall where they have to repeat after me. And they have to follow a three-step direction on their own. I ask them to write a sentence for me. I ask them to copy a design for me. And then after they've completed all of those things, we will get a score that's out of 30. 20 to 25 is kind of that mild to moderate impairment range and then typically anything below 20 out of 30 is pretty severe really in that dementia range and typically after I get a score depending on what it is I'll go into more specific testing if they are an active member in society they like to do a crossword they read the paper every day those are great exercises for the brain and so they typically those patients do better on cognitive testing whereas if I have a patient that has been um, maybe at home alone and they don't they watch a lot of TV they don't exercise their brain they're typically going to have more impairments than a patient that's really active. So that was a nice summary of uh, some of the testing and particularly looking at mini mental uh, uh, testing. Any comment about the mini mental? Um, well, there, there are several brief uh, for tests that can be done. The mini mental is one uh, example. There's a, a VA testing called uh, SLUMS, S-O-U-M-S. Uh, there's several different instruments, but all of them give you a pretty good clue when there's memory impairment. 
But if, if there's a need to go further, you can do what's called neuropsychologic testing, which is very detailed testing by a neuropsychologist, probably lasts about three hours, looking at many uh, different spheres and responses to try to decide what pattern a problem does a patient have. So uh, we talked about different causes of, uh, of dementia earlier. Would a person uh, perform differently on the, those complicated or even yes. on many mental with different kinds of dementia? How yes, so? especially the more complicated. They, they frequently can differentiate between Alzheimer's pattern versus uh, what's called a Lewy body dementia that can go along with some people with Parkinson's. Or there's another type of dementia called frontotemporal dementia and these people start out with having trouble with executive function just organizing making decisions uh, I can remember one patient the family said he always organized the the vacations he wanted to go specific places and do specific things and he gradually lost that ability to organize and plan so uh, if you were going to differentiate, now that's frontotemporal, that's yeah. from what? What is the cause of frontotemporal? Well, I don't think it's known really well. The best, it's, it's known clearly, pretty clearly, uh, the anatomic changes that take place with Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body. I mean, there's certain changes in the cells in, on, in both of those. On the autopsy? Yeah. But the frontal temporal? I think less so. Less, it's, it's more of a pattern of, of impairment. Okay. Uh, and how common is, uh, is the frontal temporal? It's un uncommon. Very uncommon. Yeah. But now something like 50% of all dementias are from Alzheimer's? I, w I would estimate that. And especially as somebody ages, if they begin to have obviously increasing memory problems, the, the most likely thing is Alzheimer's. So if you uh, looked at uh, that, uh, let's look at Parkinson's. That's the Lewy body. Mm -hmm. Explain that one. Well, many people with Parkinson's respond well to treatment and do well for a number of years, but sometimes as the disease progresses, and it might be 10 years into it or more, memory problems can develop. And sometimes not just memory, but other symptoms like visual hallucinations and and kind of more restlessness and agitation. And that's, if, if a person has Parkinson's disease, the dementia is termed Lewy body, L-E-W-Y, Lewy body dementia. Lewy body. Sometimes people are demented uh, and are happy demented. I, I was at the nursing home on Tuesday and a nurse uh, uh, saw a lady come by, waved and smiled and said, how are you? And she says, if I, if, when I get demented, that's the kind of dementia I want to have. This lady's a delight. And I've seen it, on the other hand, where people are bitter and angry and uh, are particularly spiteful to their family and, and just heartbreaking. Can you define why that happens? No, it is not known, but the, those <laughs> two distinctions you draw are true. I mean, there, there are some people who maintain their personality, cheerfulness, uh, cooperativeness, and some people do get more agitated, angry, sometimes even paranoid and suspicious. And it really isn't understood why right. this same disease causes different reactions in people. Right, it can, and it's all Alzheimer's. It's all Alzheimer's, but it, it is Im extremely important for family and clinicians to keep reminding themselves that if somebody is angry and strikes out and even aggressive, this is not in the individual's control. This is not who they were all their life. This is d a distortion wrought, wrought by the disease. Yeah. Um, that's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. So the, uh, the, that brings to mind the caregiver that's, that's supporting the person. I've heard that mild to moderate dementia, uh, people with mild to moderate dementia, 70% of them are at home, either alone, sometimes alone, but uh, often with a caregiver. That's a real demand on caregivers. It's a real demand, and I have to say it's, it's an extraordinary testimony to the love and devotion that couples and families feel for each other. 
Um, I, I see many spouses who, even when they become taxed and it becomes more difficult, say, say this is the way we want it. We've talked, often we've talked about this before we decided we're going to do this at home. Uh, the one thing I look for and worry about, though, is that sometimes a caregiver just reaches a point of exhaustion, maybe not sleeping well at night, just overwhelmed physically with the demands of, of their spouse. And in that case, sometimes it really helps for a clinician to say, you know, maybe we ought to think of a care center. Right. I mean, I think that those spouses will sometimes feel very guilty they do, and that's, and that's why I think it's helpful for the physician to anticipate that and say that from my professional standpoint, I think this is too much for you. You're, you're risk harming yourself, and, and if you fall ill or can't do this, this, this isn't good for your loved one either. And so I, I try to give spouses and families the knowledge that it isn't a sign of not caring if, if a patient eventually has to be moved, say, to a dementia unit. Right. Um, in a dementia unit, uh, the individual can get 24-hour care. Uh, they're protected from, from harming themselves if that's an issue. And so it's great. I, I am so impressed with the, pa the spouses and families who work to keep patients at home, but I also totally support uh, families who say, we've reached a point where, where we need a care center. And sometimes the kids have to say to the dad, you know, dad, it's time to take mom to the nursing home. They do. Uh, now, a lot of uh, people will say, uh, I never, I never want to go into a nursing home and they put themselves and their spouse in a bad spot. I would plead with people not to do th those words. Well. None of us can anticipate what the future is going to hold, how we'll react, how our loved ones will react. And I would agree that I, I don't think it's healthy for any of us to take an absolute stand and say a care center, nursing home would never be a good idea. Yeah. We, we hope it wouldn't be needed. Right, there but, it is. But to say I would never do that or want that, I think, is, is a premature judgment and, and one I'd argue against. Yeah, I certainly would, too. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are pretty feeble staying at home, and it makes me think about uh, doing what we can to encourage people to prepare for the time when they're feeble so they don't fall. Uh, home safety evaluations by occupational therapy and so on um, comes to mind. What, what are your comment about well, that? Well, just, just to reinforce that, it, it is part of looking after the whole person. We want to try to anticipate what could go wrong. And falls can be a devastating complication for not just people with dementia, but for people with Parkinson's and other illnesses. I mean, oftentimes if a, if a person falls and breaks a hip and has to be hospitalized and then in a nursing home, they may not completely recover. And so preventing falls as much as possible is important. I try to anticipate when patients might have diminished bone density, uh, Sometimes as a neurologist, I'm, I'm making the diagnosis of osteoporosis, for instance, but right. looking at what can be done to prevent the complications that could drastically change people's lives. I mean, you don't have to have a doctor's dire uh, directive to call occupational therapy and say, we need to have a home safety eval, but it, 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 it might help as far as payment. So talk to your doctor about uh, occupational therapy home safety evaluation. And uh, you mentioned earlier about how in medicine we rely on a team. Um, we, were, you know, and we do rely on nurses, occupational and physical therapists, speech therapists, um, social workers to give the best care. And especially in this day and age, when medica when medicine is so sophisticated, we need a group of people dedicated to trying to make things as good as they can be for people. Um, there is a concern uh, about uh, the fact that there are people on the internet and on the television and using the telephone that prey on people whose mental capacity is on the border. Uh, even sometimes when the mental capacity is pretty good, but you're 85 years of age, uh, people can take advantage of you. Uh, what, what's your comment about that? 
Well, and to acknowledge that it happens and that it, it it's bitterly uh, unfortunate when it does. I mean, I have seen uh, individuals who would do pretty well on a co short cognitive test but still have poor judgment. And if they get solicitations or encouragement to do uh, investments, they might do it without enough forethought to, to realize what they're doing. I, I think it's a, it's a problem that's kind of endemic in our country, and I think whatever can be done to curtail that kind of activity is good. The, the, the people, when they do, begin to develop all illnesses, but especially dementia or early cognitive impairment, are at risk. Right, I think there's some protective things that people can do, you know, uh, turn to your trust department and get the, uh, and your bank, or, or make sure that, 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 uh, that you can't take all of your funds and, and throw them away. And or in many families, uh, uh, people would turn to their uh, adult children, too. If, in, if, the, if there's a good relationship and the children are really supporting the parents' interests, that can be an at-home protection that can be hugely helpful. Right, you, you want to make that work. Yeah. That, that need, that's very important. We talked earlier about causes and I wanted to go back to one, uh, several other issues. Uh, one of them, in de uh, depression, another high blood pressure, uh, another about thyroid, uh, um, you know, and other subtle things that might be uh, influential as far as dementia. Well, all of those uh, entities you mentioned have to be taken into consideration. when. When a patient comes in with possible dementia and he or she and the family are worried, it's really, really important to make sure there isn't some underlying medical condition that can be corrected. And uh, looking for deficiencies, I mentioned vitamin B12, uh, low thyroid, hypothyroidism, it's, if it's severe, can, can make someone sluggish, less attentive, uh, make them act like they have a dementia. And you mentioned mood disturbance. Uh, for years, depression, deep depression, has been characterized as causing what's called a pseudo-dementia. Somebody really doesn't have cognitive impairment, but they, they uh, act like they do because they're so depressed. Yeah. And so looking at the emotional state of an individual is really important. In internal medicine, we care for people with, you know, heart disease and lung disease and kidney disease and, you know, all of the diseases. And uh, no question about it, any kind of health condition will drag a person down and uh, their mental capacity won't be what it was. So like you say, I think, and I'd emphasize that, the value of doing a general workup, make sure that there's not, you know, anemia or leukemia or, you know, some kind of kidney failure or diabetes or... Um, I did read, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say that in, when I was in training and in years after that, people would refer to so-called treatable causes of dementia, meaning vitamin deficiency or uh, subdural hematomas or hemat in the brain or something. But I think that's not a good term, I've decided, because in, at all stages of dementia, we want to be able to offer treatment and, and comfort and compassion and, go, and good yeah. advice. So we, we look for reversible causes. It would be a better way to, to state it. And some, occasionally we find them, often we don't, but we would never want to reach a point where someone is beyond treatment because I think that is not compassionate and not where we want to be. And yeah, not a good, uh, yeah. a good term or a good practice. Right, I agree. To many of us, driving, driving a vehicle seems almost automatic. However, it's actually a complex activity that requires quick reaction, thought processes, and dexterity. Alzheimer's disease and other dimensions, dementias can cause changes that affect a person's ability to drive a motor vehicle safely. Our goal is always to keep people driving as long as possible. We look at their vision first. Since that's important, they have to have the minimum vision for the state of South Dakota. So we do a screen to make sure that they have that. So your average is about 47 one hundredths of a second. And then we go and um, look at their cognition. So we do tests that look at memory, um, concentration, um, flexibility of thought. Now that's a big one for people with dementia. Oftentimes they get on one path 
and that's all they're, that's, nothing's going to stop them from that path. And you can't do that when you're driving. You need to have that flexibility of thought because driving always changes. We do a clock test, which is very indicative of executive functioning. And so they have found that if people do poorly on that, which often our patients with dementia do, that that's going to indicate they're going to have some trouble with those high level skills. And driving is one of the highest level skills we do. I always tell people that driving is one of those ADLs, those activities of daily living, probably about the only one that we do every day that could kill us and kill someone else. You know, that's why it's so important to make sure that we look at people and see if they're safe to drive. Those people that have the chronic conditions, like the Parkinson's, the MS, and dementia, oftentimes if they're not passing at this point, we're not probably going to see improvement. You know, they say that on average women live 10 years and men live about 7 years beyond their ability to drive. So that's something we don't talk about enough with older drivers. We talk about where you're going to retire, you know, what are you going to do for fun? Are you going to Arizona? What kind of house are you going to live in? But we really don't make a plan for driving. Um, I do have one gentleman I will never forget. I failed him. He was having a significant amount of trouble with driving, and he hugged me. And I think he knew that he shouldn't be driving anymore, and um, he just needed somebody to give him permission to quit. And I always applaud anybody who quits on their own. We One thing for family like members is so if your family member has gotten lost, the like the they didn't show up for their hair appointment because really? they couldn't get there, or the they show up two hours late to they your house when you they come really to your house all the time, way. you really need to get them tested or talk to them about not driving. And we always tell people up front that you know, the, if, if this doesn't go well, we might have to report you to the state of South Dakota. Um, and then once you, that person decides, or we decide they shouldn't drive and the family decides they shouldn't drive, you really need to take the car away. In South Dakota, you know, being a rural state with a large population of elderly people, um, this is something that we really need to talk to our family members about. Because we really want to keep everybody safe. So it's interesting, uh, we, we are doing this as a recording tonight because there's South Dakota football and we'll come, this will be presented sometime in the future. I'm really not sure when, Jerry. Uh, but we are live on Facebook and we have people watching and we have questions from the audience. Thank you. So one of the questions had to do with low thyroid. What would be symptoms of a person with low thyroid aside from dementia and what kind of dementia would that be? Well, um, there are multiple symptoms of, and, f and findings on examination of low thyroid, but just fatigue, um, kind of lack of ambition, would, there would be common symptoms. Uh, uh, and oftentimes, low thyroid doesn't manifest clear-cut symptoms. I think that's one of the arguments for checking thyroid periodically uh, as in, the a primary, in the primary care setting. It is so treatable, low thyroid is so treatable, that I, I routinely, and I'm sure you do too, yeah. routinely test for it. Screen, screen normal people in some sense, I mean, certainly when they're tired. But, um, low, but low thyroid wouldn't cause a flagrant dementia where somebody couldn't draw a clock, for instance, or right. couldn't remember any of three objects. It'd be more likely to cause more subtle memory problems, decreased attention. You know, if, if you're the person who, who gets up to go to the to the kitchen and, and you're thinking of what am I here after, ask your doctor to check your thyroid. It wouldn't hurt. And by the way, a B12 is the other. Uh, yeah, B12 deficiency is rare, but it's so treatable that I think it's a great thing to consider. And unfortunately, if it gets too far down the line, it, you can stop it from getting worse, but it won't turn around and get a whole lot better. Uh, that's been your experience. Yes, and it isn't just memory. It, it, <clears throat> low B12 can, can affect the spinal cord, it can affect balance, uh, leg function. Numbness, in, numbness the, in the hands and feet, you bet. Peripheral neuropathies. Uh, I wanted to also make a point about uh, blood pressure. I read an article one time uh, that uh, s did a study of 30 to 45 year old men and they looked at them over a 10 year period of time and uh, for those who had 
high blood pressure, um, and, and that's the whole group, but half of them got treated and the other didn't take their medicine, they stayed high blood pressure. The people whose blood pressures were not controlled had less acuity of their thinking than, the, than those who, who had their blood pressure controlled who, who, or who had normal blood pressure. So I think blood pressure can cause a mini stroke, a small lacunar kind of a vascular. Well, you, you can see hardening the artery changes on the MRI in particular. And if somebody has risk factors for vascular disease, like cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, poorly controlled diabetes, um, the, you frequently actually see the hardening of the artery changes. And I would, would worry that anybody with prominent changes like that uh, is at more risk for memory trouble going forward. Right. Uh, we've had the question about uh, what we can, what about the causes of dementia being from aluminum or like aluminum foil or cooking in aluminum pots or or antiperspirants, or what, what do you think about aluminum? I, I think it's, it's highly unlikely to be a major contributor in, in our society. I mean, it's, it's a topic that people have been thinking about, writing about, wondering about, but I don't think it's a major contributing factor. I think, I think it's safe to use <laughs> aluminum foil. I think, and, and also aluminum pots. Yes, they, they say it is. one, one uh, uh, tablespoon of Mylanta or Maalox is the equivalent of 10 years of cooking in an aluminum pot. I mean, it's just, it, it's not, and there's no increased incidence of Alzheimer's in people taking all that Maalox and Mylanta. But it is interesting how, and this is especially true with growing sophistication about medical issues, the internet, how there can be so many theories advanced as to why something is happening. I, I've thought about that a lot with uh, multiple sclerosis, MS. There have been strong arguments for dilating the veins or uh, eating uh, Clostrum from cow's milk or getting bee stings and none of these treatments have ever been proven to have significant efficacy and yet there's a big discussion out there and I I would encourage uh, any of our viewers who hear something like that wonder about it those things in relation to some disease ask your physician right ask your primary doctor well and I think medlineplus.gov is a site of quality uh, patient education that you could go to, medlineplus.gov, and they'll give you the true uh, poop on that. Nothing about Teflon or utensils no. or any, anything that you There's, can think of that we might have no. a cause for At, at this point, I think it's highly unlikely that any such entities are going to be proven to have a major effect. Now, there's a lot of supplements that are sold with the promise that it makes your memory better. And knowing that all of us benefit from some placebo effect, I think there are people who definitely feel better taking supplements. But there are a couple points I'd make in that regard. First of all, I would, also, I would again recommend that if you're taking supplements or other agents, let your physician know. So it can be part of your medical record, so it can be looked at to see if it's, if it's a major contributing factor. And the other thing is I would... I, I don't discourage supplements, but I do discourage people investing a lot of money in, in entities that are not likely to help. Well, unproven. Unproven. And so I, if I, I, I tell people that I want to be aware of what they're doing. I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but I don't want them to be uh, you know, putting themselves at big financial risk because they're paying so right. much money for things. The, the only l likely person to benefit from that type of treatment would be the person selling it and their billfold. <laughs> <laughs> Succinctly put, I think that might be the case. Yes. Um, so we have some treatments that are uh, on there, but I mean, as far as prevention of Alzheimer's disease or dementia of any kind, uh, your summary for the bottom line on prevention. Well. That, there's a huge amount of research right now, nationally and internationally, about dementia and Alzheimer's in particular. And what all of us yearn for is a drug that if you start it, it'll stop the advancement of, of the dementia. We don't have that yet. The drugs we have, and there are a number of them, have evidence that they may slow memory decline. 
And, uh, you know, most people I see with Alzheimer's, I use these medications, but I am very uh, forthright in saying these are not going to make you think better. They're not going to make you feel better. We're using it in the hopes that your decline in memory over time will be slower. So in a, in a way, it's a, a leap of faith. Right. And once they've, they've uh, uh, reached the level of severity, generally it is recommended to discontinue them. They can be discontinued. But I do think there is, a, is an important grain of hope for, for all of us, for diseases like, with three we've talked about today, Parkinson's disease, MS, and Alzheimer's. The amount of medical research being done is extraordinary. And so, I mean... We have hope. We have hope. We have hope. And uh, we have reason to believe that things will be better for the future. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question about, what about jellyfish? Anything with jellyfish? Nothing about jellyfish. Okay, all right. So the other question is, um, and, I, and I've heard this, and I, I'm, I'm a believer, that exercise is one health uh, activity that we can perform that has been shown to, to reverse or at least to prevent the deterioration of memory. I, I think exercise is important. I agree with you. And I also think just being engaged. There is a growing amount of of evidence that if a person begins to have memory decline, if she or he is active with family and friends, if they go to the senior center, if they go out for coffee, if they volunteer, all of these activities uh, can, can be helpful in, in terms of maintaining function. And I strongly support them. Right. Uh, I've heard, of course, and I've seen a number of people who want to keep their brain working. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And they'll do puzzles and they'll do uh, Sudoku and all those things in a matter of a regular basis to try to prevent the deterioration of the brain. And then an article comes out and says, what's the best puzzle? What's the hardest, most challenging brain protective puzzle that you can have? And the answer was a conversation. <laughs> And it's not about the weather, but maybe it is about the weather. It's, it's just any conversation that you can have because there's, what, what does a conversation carry but a very complex puzzle going on? What's the other guy thinking? What is, uh, what is he or she saying? Um, that kind of a thing. The, these kind of activities and the conversation piece uh, caused me to remember one thing I've been thinking recently about about dementia and Alzheimer's and how important it is not to think, well, life has ended. Not You're just going to push away your interests and sit around and, and wait for things to deteriorate. I, I see many people with mild dementia, beginning dementia, and I, I th take great encouragement and joy if they're still traveling. Maybe they go to Europe, they, they're visiting people around the country or whatever. To, to, to say, well, I have memory problems, but I'm still going to be involved. I'm still in the game. I think is really important. I, I boy, I can. I love to hear that. Um, I think the idea of doing as well as you can do. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that just the mere fact that 70 percent of the people with mild to moderate dementia are at home is 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 a good thing, as long as it's not causing problems for them. I agree. I like the idea of preparing your home for the time when you might be demented, and you and we should all think that because if we get demented, it's too late uh, uh, to do a lot of things. One of which would be make your will, make sure that you've got your financial things in order. That should be done before you get into trouble like that. Yeah, we're, or before you get any major illness, really, not right. just dementia. Yeah. No, and. Um, so somebody asked about luminosity and other sites on the internet and internet things. I don't think those are necessarily better than the Sudoku or the other activities that, that would keep one occupied. Uh, initially, and I, I believe that that particular company, uh, Luminosity, had advertisements purporting that they could s slow down dementia, and I think they backed away from that. Yeah, I haven't, you know, I didn't know about luminosity. A I little think birdie it's, spoke to me in the ear about it. <laughs> I, I think it's a, it's probably a good and challenging program. I mean, they, is, I and I only understand a little bit about what they do, but I think they have challenging games and exercises, and if somebody wants to do that, I'm all for it. Yeah. Well, I think if you use something 
uh, you keep working on it, it it's going to stay active. If you if you put it down and rest it, it will go away. What, what all of us want for illness is a cure, something <coughs> dramatic, something that will totally reverse things. And I think we have to be realistic. There, there are many medical conditions we don't have a cure for. But we, we pick away at it and make make small advances and do what we can to improve the situation. There's an Alzheimer's Association, uh, the AARP has a number of sites and places to go for. There's plenty of information uh, available. Uh, senior citizen centers can, can be helpful. And I think an educated public is great. You know, for patients and families to access the resources, say, of the Alzheimer's Association is wonderful. So uh, all that we've talked about on, on uh, this issue of dementia, I'm going to come back to the initial discussion we had earlier, which was all about um, ethics. Uh, my sense is that uh, there, this is one of the more difficult and, and challenging uh, areas, and particularly when it's uh, talking about uh, drivers taking away a person's right to, to drive on a borderline situation, um, taking away a person's decision making. Um, when is that right and wrong? So are there ethical issues that, that you would like to... Well, there are ethical issues. I mean, all of us want to honor a person's ability to make decisions for him or herself as long as possible. And that's called autonomy. And so we, we want people to feel involved. We want them to feel empowered. But as was mentioned uh, in the discussion about driving, there, there may come a time where the, a person is putting him or herself and others at risk. And it's a, it's a difficult conversation sometimes. Maria in the video said how much she enjoys when a patient, him or herself, says, it's time, That's it's right. time. That, that driving evaluation, by the way, that occupational therapy does, I think is extraordinarily helpful because it's, it's an objective way to decide is it still safe or not. And what I frequently tell patients is that you want to know. You, the patient, want to know. I mean, you don't want to be driving if you're putting somebody else at risk. So why not get the test? And a lot of times when I order the test, the person passes and they... And there's they, no problem. And yeah. they, but it's re, it, it reinforces the belief, the understanding that it's safe for them to drive. But on the other hand, if the result of the testing is that there are some real risks, I, I think it's really prudent and important to stop driving. And some people say, well, I only want to drive a little maybe just a little to the star, but driving a little is almost worse because you, you get out of the habit of it. And I, and I try to explain to people that, especially as they age, reflexes, response to emergencies, they change, they diminish. And the last thing any of us want is to hit a child darting out from between parked cars. There it is. And when people think about the potential risk, often they say, okay, okay. I understand this. We appreciate you and your words. And now the answer of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. For those over 85, about what percentage have some level of dementia? 75%, 50%, 25%? Well, the answer is 50%, which also means that 50% do not have some level of dementia. We'll be right back after this. Because they want you to be there for the many milestones yet to come. Because you don't want to miss out on the little things. There are many reasons to get life-saving cancer screenings. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. But regular self-exams and mammograms can catch it early when it's most treatable. Promise. 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 Make the promise to get screened. Do it for the people you love. For more information about life-saving screenings or available financial assistance, visit GetScreenedSD.org. In the U.S., there are almost 5 million people with mild to moderate dementia, and studies show that about 70% are at home, either alone or with a caregiver, often a spouse. If people with mild to moderate dementia can stay home safely, this would save Medicare and Medicaid a great deal of taxpayer money. More importantly, 
This would provide those people affected with dementia their preferred environment. Indeed, it is important to allow all people the chance to stay at home whenever possible. Recent Johns Hopkins research studied more than 250 people with dementia living at home and found that 99% of the demented and 97% of their caregivers had at least one unmet need. The foremost unmet need was defined by safety issues, which increased risk for falling, such as poor lighting in walkways. Other unmet needs included not performing regular exercise, poor follow-up with health care providers, not having prepared legal and estate planning, and not receiving needed help with medications and activities of daily living. Researchers found that those with lower income, with depression, and with borderline rather than severe dysfunction had significantly more unmet needs. When there were at-home caregivers for those folks with early dementia, the caregivers were often not aware of these deficiencies. Add to all of this, the needs of the caregivers were often ignored or unrecognized. Remarkably, at-home caregiver stress and depression was one of the strongest predictors for an early move of the person with dementia to the nursing home. Methods to enhance a person's chance of staying at home are not difficult. Preparation for legal issues in estate planning should be done early and before memory loss. Other methods include providing raised toilet seats, grab bars in the bath and bedroom, properly tacked down carpets, good nighttime lighting, and proper day and nighttime footwear. Researchers also strongly advise providing enhanced support for caregivers, such as educating them about support services available like social services and occupational therapy and caregiver support groups. In addition, screening for and treatment of any caregiver's depression should be provided. This would go a long way in helping people stay at home as they age. Bottom line, most of us and our families are not prepared for the possibility of dementia as we age. If we prepare, we greatly improve our chances for staying at home. Well, a great big thank you to our guest, Dr. Jerry Freeman of Sanford Neurology Clinic and uh, the School of Medicine uh, Neurosciences Department. We sincerely appreciate your donating your time and your knowledge and providing insight into this very important topic. Well, that does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. Avera Heart Hospital. Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Fishback Financial Corporation. Vance Thompson Vision. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Black Hills Medical Society. Third District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison and Flandreau. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee and Swift Tail Communications.